GTN, China Global Television Network. Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the course of the hour, we'll run through all the business news stories and a bit more that you need to know about from Africa and beyond. Let's start with a quick round through the markets here for you. So, ESCOM had applied for a 16.6% tariff hike that was rejected. And now it's here saying, look, the company needs a cash injection as it's struggling to service a $31 billion of debt it has on its books. Either it comes from a tariff increase, the CEO argued, or you're going to put that in as far as equity is concerned. Key concern there, spot gold rising rather steadily so far in 2020, uh, rising by over 5% to crack the $1,600 an ounce level earlier in the trading session. Gold index of the JSE had not risen to the same consistent level, but it is 3.7% higher so far over the period. Here's what's coming up tonight. Inflation in Nigeria rises to a two-year high. Billions of locusts are threatening food harvests in the eastern and the eastern end of Africa and the Horn. And China's delivery industry resumes service after weeks of lockdown. Our starting point tonight is in Nigeria. Annual inflation over there rose in January to its highest level in nearly two years. Now, according to data released by the country's National Statistics Bureau, headline inflation in January was 12.13% compared to 11.98% in December. That marks the fifth straight month of acceleration. Now, the consumer inflation rate in January was the highest since April 2018, when it was 12.48% back then. Inflation had since then dropped to its lowest in nearly four years in August, but it's risen steadily since then, and this is all due, for the most part, due to border closures. The West African country closed parts of its border, essentially all of its land borders really, to fight the smuggling of rice and other goods. But economists point out that this move has increased inflation and it's hitting consumers pretty hard. A separate food price index showed that inflation was, food price inflation rather, was at 14.85% in January compared to 14 and two thirds the previous month. And we're still in Nigeria. The country's oil ministry says it will send a new petroleum industry bill to parliament with an aim to pass it into law by the middle of the year. Now, for nearly two decades, this bill has seen various incarnations under different governments. But so far, none has managed to get it to that last push and get it signed into law. Now, the resulting uncertainty has left oil companies and investors pretty lukewarm about putting their money into Africa's largest crude oil producer. The most recent version of the bill was during President Muhammadu Buhari's first term, but disagreements between lawmakers and the executive, so the leader rejects parliament's efforts to pass a bill into law. Now, the relationship between the two sides is on a much better footing and it could pave the way for a smoother drafting and adoption of this bill and its ascent into law. So, will this time be different? Will that mythical bill finally become law? Let's examine this in a bit more detail with Gabriel Idahosa. He's a council member at the Lagos Chamber of Commerce. Good to see you on the program again, sir. So, Nigeria struggled to replace existing oil sector legislation for the better part of a decade, really. Mr. Buhari tried to have a fresh petroleum bill passed in his first term. He failed. What is different this time round, or should we be expecting more of the same? Well, the big difference this time is that there is very close uh, relationship between the National Assembly and the President. And they have demonstrated this in the last uh, six months by passing the deep offshore bill for the oil and gas industry. And that uh, has given a sign that this petroleum industry bill version that the minister is sending will pass. The President of the Senate, who is also the President of the National Assembly, has actually promised that the Petroleum Industry Bill will be passed this year. He has put it on the legislative agenda. So there's a lot of confidence that it will be passed. We just want to see when the Minister will actually present it to the National Assembly. That has not been done yet. It is when it is done that we start counting down as to how fast the actual passing of the bill will be. Right. Most of the legislators who are there now are very familiar 
with the various versions of the bill. So, so we, we expect that they will just uh, quickly deal with any gray areas and then uh, get it passed and send it back to the president for signing that is assent to, for it to become law. Uh, let's let's put this as simply as possible. What what problems does this petroleum industry bill try to cure? Is this just about increasing the state's share of oil revenues, or is it about trying to get provide incentives rather to get a lot more private capital into the oil and gas space? Uh, it, it's a bit more complicated. The petroleum industry bill actually was initially four separate bills to deal with the governance of the industry itself, to deal with the host communities where this oil is found, environmental issues, uh, economic and social uh, development of the areas. It also has to deal with the sharing of the, the, the barrel of crude oil revenue between the oil producers and the government. The, the question of royalties payable to the federal government, the, the question of taxes applicable to oil and gas producing companies, it also tried to deal with allocation of the federal revenue out of the oil and gas to the various interest groups in Nigeria. So it's a, a pretty complicated bill, and that's one reason why it has not been passed all this time. Right. But the good thing is that most of the legislators there now are familiar with the history of the bill. Some of them have been there for the last 15 years. They have seen the various versions of the bill. And there's a general consensus as to how to deal with the various issues, the, the community issues, the incentives to the oil and gas companies, the sharing of revenues between the oil and gas companies and the federal government, and the sharing, the domestic sharing of the revenue within the country. So there, there's a clear understanding between government and the legislators that these matters have been flogged about enough. Everybody understands what everybody wants and it's a matter of give and take. The oil and gas companies have to give more to the government. The government has to give more to the, the host communities and various parts of the country have to also compromise the sharing of crude uh, revenues so those are all the issues that are uh, in the bills. Right. So let, me, let me just narrow it down into one specific issue. Because there have been be concerns based on past drafts, for instance, that the changes to the law would make, uh, for instance, the deep offshore oil and gas deposits potentially unattractive to investors. Um, the draft, as you pointed out, isn't out just yet. But why would this be the case, assuming that the past drafts might eventually make it into law? Well, the, the deep offshore oil and gas law itself has already been passed. That was one of the last things they did last year. It was an amendment to an existing law. So that essentially was taken out of the, the, the agenda of the petroleum industry bill and passed. And the oil and gas industry already has a deep offshore bill to work with. For, for, the, for the oil and gas companies, the deep offshore is the best assets that they want to have. The, the largest reserves of Nigeria are there. They are safer in terms of community issues. And so we have fairly uh, settled the, that matter of the deep offshore. But there's a lot of oil and gas in the shallow waters and on, the, on, 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 on shore. And all of that is yet to be sorted out in the petroleum industry bill. So that, that's where the real work is, to ensure that the shallow waters and the onshore oil and gas resources are included in this petroleum bill or bills, depending on what we get from the minister to the National Assembly. It might be one bill or it might be several bills dealing with various matters connected with the oil and gas industry. Indeed. Well, it's been mythical for the better part of a decade. So let's see if that actually changes in the course of the week. Uh, uh, Gabriel Idahosa, live there in Lagos. Now, the Central Bank of Tunisia has announced that Moody's upgraded Tunisia's outlook from negative to stable, and it's affirmed its B2 rating. Authorities say that the North African economy's economic situation has improved slightly, but there are many challenges ahead. Here's CGTN's Adin Chwaji with more.
The minister in charge of structural reforms said this upgrade is mainly due to the reduction of the current account deficit, the improvement of the foreign exchange reserve and the reduction of the public debt burden. Such elements have significantly reduced the level of risk related to the microeconomic stability. This upgrade says the outlook is no longer as negative as it was a few months ago. The future could be stable but difficult. Moody said the affirmation of the B2 rating reflects external vulnerability risk that remains elevated in light of large external financing needs and high debt burden still vulnerable to potential currency and financing shocks. Tunisia continues with the current economic orientation. Moody's will improve the notation but not the perspective. The Finance Committee at Parliament said that the new government must be formed as soon as possible because political instability and uncertainty will impact economic indicators. Moody's warned that the political paralysis or the inability to form a government will delay the implementation of outlined physical and business environment reforms and could result in a downgrade. Moody's upgrade also takes into account the relative strength of Tunisia's institutions and governance and the potential for the economy to return to stronger growth rates. According to the Central Bank of Tunisia, the upgrade decision came following an on-the-site review conducted by Moody's four months ago. The agency also held meetings with the government, the General Labour Union and the Confederation of Industry, Trade and Handicrafts. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Now, before heading to Ethiopia, where he was today, the U.S. Secretary of State was in Angola on Monday. Mike Pompeo lauded the Angolan president while Lorenko's anti-corruption drive. The Trump administration is looking to revitalize its relations with African economies. As CGTN's Beryl Oro now reports. You all have the heavy oil in the water. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was touting American business in Angola as the world's biggest economy battles rival superpower China for economic influence on the African continent. Uh, we'll do our part uh, to help the Angolans achieve prosperity. Angola is sub-Saharan Africa's third largest economy and second largest oil producer. U.S. corporations such as ExxonMobil and Chevron have significant stakes there. But despite these investments, the bulk of Angola's oil is destined for China, which also holds the lion's share of Angola's foreign debt. The Trump administration accuses China of predatory lending in Africa, where Beijing has loaned governments billions of dollars in exchange for access to natural resources. But some African governments question Donald Trump's own commitment to the continent. The White House last month tightened visa restrictions on nationals from Sudan, Tanzania, Eritrea and Nigeria, and West African governments are also worried about a proposed U.S. troop withdrawal from the region, just as Islamist militants are gaining ground. Pompeo told reporters that the U.S. needs to, quote, get security right here in order to enable economic growth. Corruption is the enemy of the nation's growth and progress. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was also keen to denounce corruption. Angola is ranked as one of the world's most corrupt nations, although it has seen a crackdown against graft since President Joao Lourenço took office in 2017. Beryl Oro, CGTN. A quick run through some company headlines now. Let's start in Kenya. The country's biggest telecommunications company, Safaricom, has opened talks with undisclosed investors to form a consortium that will bid later this year for one of two Ethiopian telecommunications licenses. That's due to the high entry costs that are likely to breach the $1 billion mark. Now, Safaricom's bid to get into the Ethiopian market is expected sometime around Q2. Egypt's eastern tobacco company revenues rose 7.5% year-on-year to $492 million in the first half of the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Now, the company's gross profits are also up by nearly 14%. $201 million was the number. That represents a 9.3% increase in net profits to $141 million. That was driven by an increase in volume and better pricing compared to the previous period under consideration. 
Amazon's CEO, Jeff Bezos, has pledged $10 billion to help fight climate change. And the world's richest man said the money would finance work by scientists, activists and other groups. He has an estimated net worth of more than $130 billion, which makes his pledge worth nearly 8% of his net worth. And finally, HSBC says it will share about $100 billion in assets, shrink its investment bank and revamp its businesses in the United States and Europe. Now, this drastic move, unfortunately, does mean that 35,000 jobs will be cut over the next three years. The bank has struggled to keep pace with leaner and much more focused rivals, and it's seeking to become more competitive as it grapples with slowing growth in the major markets in which it operates. That's a run through your company headline. You're watching Global Business Africa. Time for a short break. Here's what's coming up next. We'll explore how billions of locusts are threatening food security in Eastern Africa. And betting companies are cashing in on the sports betting craze in Nigeria. The details are coming up shortly. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global Business Reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Okay. Head up Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible? And why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sumitra Hello, Naro. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. Welcome back to the program. Now, the East African region, where we're based at the moment, could be on the verge of an enormous food crisis if a huge swarm, or swarms actually, of locusts that are devouring crops and pasture are not brought under control. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization is now calling on the international community to help provide the $76 million that's needed to fund the cost of spraying the affected areas and to get this infestation under control. With the details, here's CGTN's Penina Karibe. Yeah, I fear, I fear it a lot because it has never happened ever since we, we came to this place. It is the first of the kind and it is so terrifying. The United Nations describes the situation here as the worst in nearly 25 years. This swarm of billions of locusts are devouring everything in a matter of hours. They've already covered hectares across Kenya, Somalia and Ethiopia, threatening the food security and the livelihood of millions. But now scrambling to respond to their arrival is Uganda. Tracking is the biggest uh, challenge, but otherwise uh, we've been uh, tracking them and where we get information from the, the local people, then we immediately uh, respond and the response has been good and we have been able to really kill quite a huge number of them. The scale of the invasion in Eastern Africa is like nothing in recent memory. It's a daunting prospect for a region where food security is already precarious. African farmers have struggled in recent years with destructive pest attacks, including the full armyworm and tomato leaf miner. However, experts believe the desert locust may be the most dangerous yet. Yeah, the spraying is a bit effective, but to me, I thought it would be good for the government to use the aerial method of spraying, whereby they use the aeroplanes for spraying through the, the, the air, but spraying with the spraying pumps like this, some of them will die and others will fly away. 
and those ones which, which will fly are going to lay eggs and are going to reproduce. To control the invasion, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization is working with governments and other groups. The agency initially asked for $76 million to control the spread, but by the 10th of this month, it had only received about $20 million. The desert locusts, despite the name, thrive following periods of heavy rainfall. Experts believe the rare cyclones that struck eastern Africa last year are the primary culprit for the region's infestation. And if the weather trends continue, they argue there may be more to come. Penina Karibe, CGTN. All right, there's quite a bit to get through on this particular story. It covers uh, essentially the eastern end of the continent and the Horn of Africa in a bit more detail. Dr. Tobias Takabarasha is the interim representative for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Agency here in Kenya. He's with me in studio tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rama. So I guess let's just start with the bad news and get it out of the way. How much worse could this get? This could get worse if no action is taken because the size of these swarms are so huge that you need urgent action to prevent catastrophe. I've seen this being described as something that we last saw, you know, a few hundred years ago. Is, is that an accurate? In the case of Kenya, yeah. 70 to 75 years ago is when we last saw this magnitude of uh, desert locust invasion. In the case of Somali and uh, Ethiopia, 25 years. Okay, scary. So what exactly happened? Because that, that, looking at the times that we're looking at here, this, this hasn't happened. The conditions that give rise to swarms this big haven't happened in years. So what, what is different this time around? What is different this time around, there have been two cyclones in the Indian Ocean which could have contributed to creating conditions that are conducive for the breeding of locusts. Including Cyclone Idai last year. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the uh, locusts, they are... Uh, tend to breed more when there is uh, hot, wet, moist conditions. And uh, the cyclone also motivates the movement of locusts. Mm -hmm. They move through using the wind. Right. So from the Arabian Peninsula through the Red Sea over into Somalia and uh, Ethiopia, the wind facilitated the rapid movement of the locusts into Kenya. And by you know, the third week of December, we had the uh, sightings of uh, locusts in the three counties in northern Kenya. As we speak now, this has spread to over 17 counties in Kenya. Which is, wow, okay, that's a significant performance. That's Almost roughly a, a third, third of the country. Out of 47 counties. Right, now, the, from the maps that I did see about where these locust infestations, these swarms have been spotted, the one concern that did emerge is around commercial agriculture. So tea plantations, coffee plantations, it seems like those areas that pretty much on the borderline of where these swamps are. Are they at risk? Not yet, and not likely to be at risk. As you know, tea and coffee, they thrive in the highlands, which are cooler, mm -hmm. and those are not very conducive environments for the breeding of uh, locusts. So we have not yet seen the threat or the invasion of locusts in the tea and coffee plantations. But in the pastures and the green fields, this is where we have seen the, the locust swarms coming in huge sizes. So essentially this is a threat if you're looking at it from the perspective of pastoralists, pastoralists. or essentially northern Kenya, northeastern Kenya, and also smallholder farmers because essentially alongside the coast going down towards right. Tanzania, they're also likely to be affected. Certainly. The majority of smallholder farmers, they are pastoralists. They depend on the pastures and the food that, that comes from the grass. The same rain that we like to make the environment green is the same rain that also creates breeding conditions for, for locusts. So basically, it's a, you know, you're hit from both ends. You, you really can't catch a break. You, we really can't catch a, a break, but we have to take action before the next long uh, season, the rains that start March, April, when most of the farmers start planting their crops. So between now and March, we are intensifying efforts to ensure that uh, uh, the locusts, the second generation of locusts, does not uh, come into to become bigger swarms than the first generation that we've just been dealing with. You need $76 million uh, to deal with this particular infestation. Um, where are you on fundraising and where will that money go? What is it funding? First and foremost, the estimate for the three countries is $76 million US dollars to deal with uh, the locust uh, invasion. Mm -hmm. So far, responses have reached up to $22 million US dollars with some in the pipeline. Where that money goes, it goes into hiring of aircraft, 
and it goes into procurement of pesticides, chemicals, spraying equipment, and uh, supporting the logistics on the ground, including vehicles for scouting and the surveillance. Mm -hmm. So that is the big chunk of the cost. The, because the argument that some would make is, I mean, look, all, if you look at all the countries that we have in this region, um, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, um, they essentially all have standing militaries, and those uh, entities that get billions of dollars every single year. Um, what is it that we need to do to retrofit them, for lack of a better word, to be able to deal with something of this crisis? To be able to deal with future crises, there's what we call disaster risk management and a preparedness. Governments in this part of the world, mind you, they have also experienced the floods and the droughts, and that they have been building up their resilience and the capacity to deal with the situations of this nature. But the magnitude of these situations is such that countries on their own may not have sufficient budgets to deal with the effects. Mm -hmm. And we are saying to the countries it is better to deal with the controlling of the locusts than to wait when the effects on food security are such that the requirement and the amount needed to feed people will be much bigger. Much, much higher. Exactly. All right, so Dr. Tobias Takafarasha, thank you very much for your time this evening. Appreciate thank you, it. Rama. All right, much appreciated. All right, then, so let's move on to the business of brewing. Uh, South African Breweries and its parent company, AB InBev, have launched a new broad-based black economic empowerment scheme. The new plan allows black retail investors to secure shares in the brewing giant. And it comes as a current landmark ACB Zenzele scheme, matures in April this year. CGTN's Angelo Coppola has the details. This follows on the first scheme that generated around $660 million for shareholders and paid out $275 million in dividends to its 40,000 beneficiaries. Yes, then I improved my business. So it's not, I, I was not having a lot, but yeah, it's something that it improves. I've got something, I reinvested the other man that I've got. So I've got, uh, I'm an investor right now from Zenzele. The 10-year-old scheme comes to an end in April, and current shareholders will be given an option to stay invested or to cash out when the new $372 million scheme lists on the JSE. The old scheme was an unlisted entity. So the real reason why we're moving from private to public today and why we're here at the JSE uh, is to provide both those things, so pricing transparency through a market listing and liquidity as well. So we think both those things will benefit the beneficiaries. The listings environment in South Africa reflects the rather muted economic growth in the country, currently with growth pegged at around 0.8% for the year. The exchange has to be rooted in the economy in which it operates and in, us, in South Africa much of the trading that happens happens in the institutional environment which is the pension fund environment where we really need to see growth in order to invigorate and to grow the economy is in the retail sector and the black economic empowerment deals that we're seeing such as SAB are vital for getting ownership into the hands of the man in the street. The SAB scheme has been one of the key examples of how black economic empowerment can work in South Africa and this new iteration is sure to follow on with that trend. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, Nigeria's gaming industry has seen quite the growth over the last decade. One reporting fact estimated the West African nation generates roughly $180 million just in gaming activities every year. So what exactly is behind this vast growth? CGTN's Deji Badmus sought to answer that question. It's boom time for the gaming industry in Nigeria, especially the sports betting segment, which is not just the dominant but the most lucrative. Virtually every street corner in Lagos, for instance, has at least one side corner sport betting sport like this one. At the very heart of what is driving the expansion is Nigeria's large youthful population and the country's crazy love for football. All the top football clubs in the world, especially in the English Premiership, Spanish La Liga, and the Italian Serie A have a huge fan base here. In many of the leagues for sport betting, wherein people play, uh, wherein people play, the Nigerians have an affinity towards these superstars, so they put their money behind them. Internet penetration is rapidly growing in Nigeria and projected to reach around 187 million people in 2023. This increasing access to the internet is also helping to drive up the numbers in the country's gaming industry. With access, with cheaper data and um, cheaper mobile phones, 
the industry has grown at a very fast pace. And education also has also been important. People are now more educated than they were before. And um, the opportunity where in that, um, you can put in a small token or a small amount of money to get something quite big. And um, also the opportunity of entertainment where you back the team at which you support. That's for sports betting. As the number of punters continue to grow, so does the number of operators. As of 2017, the Lagos State Lottery's board alone had issued at least 40 licenses to operators, according to one report by PricewaterhouseCoopers, and the operators are raking in huge revenue. A 2016 report by KPMG estimates that one of the leading sports betting companies in Nigeria was making an average of $10 million monthly. That astounding figure has poured a number of foreign sports betting companies to also enter the Nigerian market, hoping to cash in. But there's a twin problem of underage gamers and betting addiction. On our own end there, yeah, we do a lot to ensure that we, uh, we don't have underage, underage gamers who join our online platform. And in our shops also, in many of our shops, the 247 shops, our agents are trained to identify uh, customers who are below the age of 18 also. So the, 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 the awareness is there, and we are doing our best to reduce um, addiction to gambling also. Unlike sports betting and virtual gaming, casino gaming still lags behind, no thanks to its seemingly limited access. Young people have simply not warmed up to it and generally see it as too upper class. But analysts say that will change with innovations. Generally, the gaming industry in Nigeria is considered one of the fastest growing in the world. And there are projections the country would soon be the number one in terms of revenue generation on the continent pretty soon. Deji Badmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. You're watching Global Business Africa. Time for a short break. Here's what's coming up next. China's delivery industry resumed service after weeks of lockdown. And what on earth does climate change have to do with London Fashion Week? We'll answer that question when we come back. No one, no one again, he can hold in guns. Machine guns from police forces to work. Protesters. Were you worried about your life at that no. particular time? Not at all. The FTT, thank you very much for your time. What is your assessment of the state of the continent today? Africa has the potential to pie itself. Excuse me. <laughs> Business in Africa is at a crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. Back to the program. You're watching Global Business Africa. Let's make a run through some of the stories making your headlines at this hour, starting in South Sudan. President Salva Kiir was scheduled to meet the opposition leader, Riek Machar, in Juba to try and resolve the pending issues on a number of boundaries and states in the country. After a pretty long stalemate on the issue of, of administrative units in the country, President Kiir agreed to revert back to 10 states with three special administrative areas. But the opposition leader is rejecting that offer. He's demanding that the administrative areas be removed entirely. 
Elsewhere, Lesotho's first lady has appeared in court. Masaya Tabane is uh, facing the charge of murder after being linked with the assassination of Prime Minister Tom Tabane's estranged wife back in 2017. Now, the case has gripped the Southern African Kingdom as calls for the Prime Minister Tom Tabane's resignation intensify. The 80-year-old Premier has already agreed to resign based on his advanced age, but he's not given any tentative date or timelines for when that can happen. And finally, the United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has met with Ethiopia's reformist Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed Ali and other officials on the final leg of his African tour. His visit in Ethiopia focused on security ahead of Ethiopia's elections later this year in August, investment and the dispute with another American ally, Egypt, over the construction of a giant hydroelectric dam across the Nile. That's a run through your headlines. All right, then let's get you the latest data in hand on the coronavirus or COVID-19 outbreak, if you prefer. The total number of confirmed cases in China is now over 72,000. The death toll stands over 1,800. 13,000 individuals, however, have recovered. The daily number of new confirmed cases in the country has fallen to less than 2,000 for the first time since the start of the outbreak. Now, the majority of confirmed cases in China are in the central province of Hubei, nearly 60,000 so far. 70% of them are in the provincial capital of Wuhan, where the outbreak started. Outside of Hubei, the provinces of Guangdong, Zhejiang and Henan are the most affected areas. Each of those has more than 1,100 cases. Beijing has reported 387. Shanghai is 333. The virus has spread to 25 other countries, which have altogether reported over 900 cases. Japan is the worst country outside China, one death and 616 cases. The bulk of those, however, are passengers who are currently quarantined on a cruise ship. After weeks of near-total shutdown, cities across China hope to resume work as soon as possible, while at the same time continuing the fight against the COVID-19 outbreak. The State Postal Bureau, for instance, announced that the delivery industry should resume work on the 10th of February. As CGTN's Lu Sirui reports, the delivery service is not only one of the first to resume services, but it's also eager to take on its share of social responsibilities in dealing with this outbreak. Eight in the morning, a new day is unveiled by the buzz from a sterilization machine. This is a distribution site in Beijing of ZTO, one of China's biggest delivery companies. Scooters, baskets or newly arrived packages, nothing will be exempted from disinfection. Ho Yongmeng worked as a delivery boy for the past two years. He's seen his workload reduced by half, alongside his wages. Usually, I only need to deliver packages to one community. Now, I have to send to three. Today, I'd have to deliver around 200 packages. Like his colleagues, Ho feels obliged to resume work as quickly as possible. In ZTO, 70% of its delivery staff are back at work. The resumption of delivery service matters not only in the economic sense, as the virus continues, it means we'd have to shoulder greater social responsibilities. The reason why many of us are able to stay at home is because the delivery staff are able to do their jobs. Even though the majority of them are back at work, it doesn't translate to the recovery of the industry. Delivery personnel find it difficult to deliver packages due to road closures and traffic controls across regions imposed as a result of the virus. There are also fewer packages to deliver due to the decline of online shopping. As compared to the same period in previous years, we now have only one-third of our business. That's mainly because the online retailers have not resumed work. There's also a sense of distrust among our customers on how we work. So ZTO is now working out a set of safe delivery procedures. We want to cultivate a feeling of trust. I think when the outbreak eases by the end of March, the sense of trust will increase and we'll see a big improvement in our business. For now, the delivery staffs are not allowed to enter most communities in Beijing. For Ho, it means endless phone calls to customers to get them to pick up their packages and more time spent waiting at the gates. 
State Post Bureau planned that the country's delivery industry should be restored to over 40 percent of its normal capacity in mid-February. In addition, postal management will coordinate with relevant development to solve problems during the epidemic, such as the permits for vehicles to pass through, couriers going into residents' communities for delivery, and the use of smart delivery lockers. Lu Sire, CGTN, Beijing. Now, the epidemic is hurting the agricultural sector and many farmers are feeling the financial pressure. But big data, apparently, is now coming to the rescue. This is a family farm that grows rice and corn. The owner needs a big loan to keep the farm afloat. But the coronavirus outbreak makes it difficult to go to the banks and get the financial help. That's why the owner is looking for loans online. They use big data for risk assessment and loan approval. We use big data to track farms' credibility, business operations and assess the risks to grant them loans. All the loan approvals are done automatically in our system. So now farmers in the region can take no more than a minute to get loans that are worth as much as half a million yuan. This comes in particularly handy for small business owners in the middle of the epidemic. There is an 89 billion yuan funding gap for the agriculture sector in our province this season. So far, 59 billion yuan has been raised despite the epidemic in China. Xia Cheng, CGTN. Now, the economic damage that we're seeing from the COVID-19 outbreak isn't just limited to China itself. Apple, for instance, warned on Monday that it was unlikely to meet first quarter sales guidance set given this outbreak. The tech giant said that manufacturing facilities in China have started to reopen, but they're ramping up a lot more slowly than expected. Apple said that essentially means that fewer iPhones will be available for sale around the world. In the meantime, some of Apple's stores in the country remain closed or they're operating at greatly reduced hours. Apple said that hurt sales, that will essentially hurt sales really this quarter. Now, analysts do estimate that the virus may slash demand for smartphones in China by half in the first quarter. And it's pretty much the same thing that we're seeing in uh, the most uh, industrial economy in Western Europe. It's been a very tough 12 months for the German economy. GDP growth was virtually zero in the last quarter of 2019. And back then, that was mostly down to a combination of trade tensions and Brexit. But now some economists are warning that this COVID-19 outbreak could tip Europe's largest economy into a full-blown recession. CGTN's Guy Henderson filed this report. It's more than 8,000 kilometres from the outbreak's epicentre. And yet bosses at this factory outside Stuttgart say COVID-19 could soon start hitting output. Zia Labeg's industrial fans go into, amongst other things, Chinese hospitals. But it's China operations facing serious disruption, and that is already affecting revenues. The situation in China will affect us definitely. So the next couple of weeks we will be probably only working with 45-50% of our working capacity, original one, so that will be, have an effect not only on our Chinese organization, but also on the whole organization. So 2020 will be pretty tough, and that does not apply only for us. It will also apply to our customers, because we can on, also not produce a full load. Its German plant could, in theory, start picking up some of the slack, though production costs would rise. The bigger problem, though, is that in a couple of weeks, it could start running out of parts. This goes further than the Chinese operations of German companies. Economists say that German exports to China are bound to be hit, firstly, but there are also a lot of German companies here and in other parts of the world who, to some extent, rely on materials that originate in China. So if those stop arriving on time, well, that starts to have a more significant impact on overall output. Take Germany's beleaguered auto industry, still the backbone of the economy. It relies on Chinese demand, but also Chinese components. Fiat has already announced a plant closure in Serbia due to supply shortages. Germany's big car brands are yet to follow suit, but they're clearly worried. The fact that the duration and severity of the outbreak are unknown at this stage generates uncertainty over the near-term economic prospects in China and abroad. The uncertainty comes with broad-based global ramifications for manufacturing with its cross-border supply chains. The German economy stopped growing at the end of last year. Some economists worry COVID-19 could drag it and even the rest of the Eurozone into recession. China is Germany's largest trading partner, so the fallout from this virus is likely to hurt it 
more than most. Guy Henderson, CGTN, Baden-Württemberg. The Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives is in Brussels for bilateral talks with EU leaders. These talks do come amid continued tensions, however, over the role that Huawei is playing in the rollout of 5G networks in Europe. Nancy Pelosi reiterated American concerns about potential security threats if EU leaders approve plans to allow the Chinese telecommunications giant a limited role in building out these networks. With the details, here's CGTN's Lucy Howe. Well, Huawei is seemingly the one area on which Nancy Pelosi and President Trump agree. The Speaker of the House of Representatives is in Brussels to try and continue to pile on the pressure on Europe to fall into line on China. Nancy Pelosi shares the view of the Trump administration about the potential risks of engaging with the Chinese telecoms giant and any involvement in Huawei in the rollout of 5G technology in Europe. Pelosi has been meeting the presidents of the EU Council and Commission Charles Michel and Ursula von der Leyen here in Brussels underlining uh, those potential risks. Following his meeting, President of the EU Council Charles Michel tweeted that this underlined the transatlantic alliance which was indispensable in meeting today's complex challenges. But this comes two days after the Munich Security Conference where the consensus seems to be it demonstrated quite how fraught tensions are between the US and Europe, particularly on areas such as defence and security. Mark Esper, the U.S. Defense Secretary, even said that the NATO alliance may be at risk should divergences continue on the use of Huawei. Uh, but of course, uh, this demonstrates in broader terms quite what a bind the EU is in at the moment in positioning itself between the U.S. and China. It's both trying to toughen its policies towards China, whilst also trying to sign off a long-awaited trade deal with a crucial summit taking place in Leipzig in Germany in September. Now, the list of stocks eligible to trade on the Hong Kong Stock Connect scheme has been announced. As expected, Alibaba is not on that list. Now, that decision comes despite the Chinese e-commerce giant's secondary listing on the Hong Kong bourse last November. For the details, here's CGTN's Yu Wen. Alibaba's current valuation in Hong Kong is some 4.6 trillion Hong Kong dollars. But given that the company's main listing is in New York, it is subject to the supervision of the New York Stock Exchange. As such, its listing reviews and information disclosure are significantly different from other firms in the Stock Net program. There are other regulatory concerns as well. Because of the accounting system, when it comes to reporting the company earnings, so this company still probably can use the U.S. or European accounting rules to, to report their earnings and consider as the delisting risk because of the procedures for this type of, uh, of the companies um, to delist from Hong Kong if they want. The procedure is much easier and simpler uh, compared to um, other companies. Alibaba's listing in Hong Kong was the biggest the special administrative region has seen in almost a decade. And it's gained around 23% in value since then. Analysts say, therefore, that it's not Alibaba that wants approval to trade on the Stock Connect. For the company itself, that would be just a bonus. It won't have much effect on the company's fundamentals or its investment value in the longer term. And it doesn't have much effect on Hong Kong's capital market one way or the other. For Chinese mainland investors, however, it is a big deal. The Stock Connect program has become a major way for mainland investors to diversify their portfolios, and they make up the largest proportion of investors in the Stock Connect schemes. Data from China Merchant Securities show that the transaction volume of mainland investors trading Hong Kong stocks via the Shanghai Hong Kong and Shenzhen Hong Kong Connects came to 750 billion yuan in 2018, and the amount is more than 1 trillion yuan as of now. And many of them are looking forward to trading Alibaba shares as well. Other than the Stock Connect programs, investors can also purchase fund products or trade on the Hong Kong exchange directly. But it's difficult to get much return from fund products, and the investment procedures aren't transparent enough. For direct investments, the transaction fees are higher than that of the Stock Connect programs, and so they involve foreign exchange risk. All of these problems could be avoided if only local investors could deal directly in Alibaba's Hong Kong shares on the Stock Connect. Hong Kong's exchange has proposed to the Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission changes to the Stock Connect rules that will allow this to happen. 
and is now waiting for a reply from Beijing. Chinese mainland regulators have shown willingness to relax similar regulations in the past. Last year, for the first time, China greenlit smartphone maker Xiaomi and food delivery giant Meituan Dianping, both mainland firms with a primary listing in Hong Kong and weighted voting rights for entry into the StockNet program. UNICS for CGTN, Shanghai. Now, one of the key dates on the fashion calendar, London Fashion Week, is underway. This year, the show's uh, promised to lead an emission for the industry to become more sustainable. It's promising a decade of change. But should we really pay attention to this? Here's our correspondent, Catherine Drew, exploring if green is a new black. From sustainable fabrics to recycled hangers, London Fashion Week has pledged to become more eco-conscious and lead the charge for the industry to follow suit. It's making sure that you are addressing all of the challenges from uh, the materials that were used, uh, the amount of waste created, uh, what happens to that waste to make sure that it's going to the right kind of recycling plants to have the partners to do that for you properly, uh, to look at energy usage, to think about green energy. <laughs> Chinese designer Hu Shanzheng says he always considers the environmental impact of every aspect of production and this year didn't send paper tickets to his show. Always thinking of, you know, by cutting, you know, the, you know, extra usage of energy, um, you know, also concern, concerning about, you know, not, you know, making all the necessary stockings for, uh, you know, for the collection so we don't really have tons of fabric being ordered also you know, extra um, garment has been manufactured. So, you know, we're literally doing every little bit to actually, you know, maintain our sustainability. Some estimates put fashion production as responsible for 10% of global carbon emissions. They also suggest that the fashion industry is the second largest consumer of the world's water supplies. But despite these pledges, environmental campaigners targeted London Fashion Week, arguing seismic change is needed in one of the major polluting industries in the world. But those in fashion say the industry is changing slowly, in reaction to consumer demand. So this is bamboo. Longtime fashion manufacturer Miranda Dunn launched her own design label three years ago, with an eye to developing slow fashion using sustainable materials and making clothes to order. It has to change and I think any new brand that's starting today has to be sustainable because it, it has to change, we all know that. So it's, it's, it's definitely a trend, it's a trend in the high street and as well as designer. So it's not just, it doesn't matter where you are in the market, it, it is changing. But can an industry built on selling the latest looks in large quantities really be sustainable? And will consumers set their own trends and increasingly reject? Prices here for you. So jitters about the demand for industrial metals due to the COVID-19 output. Notwithstanding, palladium seems to exist in its own parallel dimension. It's gone up by nearly 32% in seven weeks to $2,581 an ounce at 1,600 GMT. But actually, a brock in that. We'll need to check that, that number for you a little later. A strong start to the year for cocoa seems to have run out of steam as well. Uh, futures for We'll introduce you to a South African potter who's bringing ethnic influences into his art. Welcome back. Let's take you to Garden Roots in South Africa, where Eugene Lewis, a self-trained potter, creates original handmade pieces inspired by the Rainbow Nation's diverse culture. Secretary so Julie Shai visited Lewis and Neisner and filed this report on grassroots. Eugene Lewis has worked at Tribal Art Pottery Studio for 22 years, a magical place that changed his life. The day I went into the workshop, I was like amazed when I saw these figurines all over the place. And I told myself, yeah, imagine you can do this. 
and then that's where it started and I was just like always passionate about it. It was just like it bring you back to yourself. I see this as therapy. That's what I think it driven me to, to become a potter. <laughs> it changed my life immensely. At his small studio, Eugene works bundles of clay into one-of-a-kind handcrafted ceramic figurines, turning his art into a profitable business. I started with the ceramics. There were only three designs, which were the causes, the Zulu, and then the belly. When I start working with it on myself, I discover that I love a country, South Africa. And we got like 11 um, cultures and languages. So that inspires me because every culture is unique. So for me, it was to bring out all our tribes. We all are unique and there's something special about everybody. For me, it's amazing to create something out of nothing. And it, that inspires me to do things which nobody's do. And you know that you are one of a kind doing things is what drives me every day just to come out and be motivated and do this beautiful figurine. Naisna is a popular tourist destination and Eugene hopes his figurines offer visitors a chance to learn more about South Africa's diverse culture. Tourists love it, especially the causes because it relates to Nelson Mandela and they know about so Durban, the Zulu, so those are some of the top sellers. My thing is to supply curio shops locally in our, in our country and export. It is one of my main focuses to do export. Free-spirited Eugene Lewis creates these most outstanding indigenous figures that tell South Africa's rich tribal stories to the world. Julie Shire, CGTN, Naisna, South Africa. All right, and so a quick run through the currencies for you. As I mentioned earlier on in the bulletin, um, Nigeria, inflation rising for the fifth month in a row, close to a two-year high. The food price index essentially rising to 14.85%. All because Africa's largest oil producer has decided to shut down its land borders to trade since August last year. Um, over in Kenya, revenue data coming out from Kenya for the first half of this fiscal year. The country is running a fiscal deficit well ahead of its target at about 2.8% of GDP. Tax revenues 12% short of target. All categories falling short of interest, though import duties didn't just miss their target. They also fell compared to the same period a year earlier. Right then, those are your currencies and that's it for tonight's edition of Global Business Africa. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the content you've seen in the last hour. There are many ways to get your thoughts back to us, all of them on your screens right now. I'm Brahman Young in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you for your company in the last hour. The World Today is up next from Washington, D.C.